The French are rebelling at government plans to raise the retirement age. President Emmanuel Macron says pension reforms are essential and vital to balance the budget. Trade union leaders, though, are promising what they're calling the mother of all battles, using strikes and protest rallies. All of that threatens a repeat of the chaos of last year when petrol stations ran dry during weeks of industrial action at oil refineries. So, can Macron push his plan through this time? Or has he lost France? Welcome to the program. I'm Philip Hampshire. It's an age-old issue in France about old age. The government wants the retirement age raised by two years to 64. And from 2027, all employees will need to have worked for 43 years to receive a full pension. President Macron is playing down the threat of crippling strikes in protest at the plans. Analysts say he's moving away from his usually centrist politics and seeking to please right-wing parties that support his reforms. He shelved reform proposals three years ago because of mass protests and the COVID crisis. So, why does President Macron think he can succeed now? Indeed, can he? So let's meet our guests. Here in London, we have Charlotte Minviel. She's co-chair of the French Green Party in the UK. Meanwhile, in Lancaster in Northern England, Renaud Foucault, he is a senior lecturer in economics at Lancaster University. And in Antwerp in Belgium, we have Pierre Morin. He is a member of the French centrist party working on French employment and the economy. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me today. Charlotte, if I can start across with you. Um, these pension reforms, in your opinion, are they fair, are they reasonable or not? No, they're absolutely not fair. Um, they are uh, a political choice and they are not a necessity. President Macron was actually opposed to this reform when he uh, first came to power and now he is pushing this reform through, which is very much a conservative political choice, which is at the detriment of um, the most marginalized people in our society. Because let's remember that actually pushing back this age from 62 to 64 is really going to be at the detriment of those that are working in the most painful jobs and professions. Um, the age of um, people who are in a good condition uh, and have a life expectancy in a good um, health condition is actually um, 64. And by the time um, the poorest people um, reach 62, actually 25% of them will have died. So this reform is really going to be at the detriment of those that are working in the most painful jobs and that have started to work um, younger um, and uh, so to the most vulnerable in our society. Yeah, um, Charlotte is saying there that uh, these changes would unfairly penalize people who are at the lower end of the income spectrum. Uh, they would penalize people who are doing harder jobs, things like being a steel worker or a coal miner, because simply their jobs are harder. They deserve to retire younger. What's your opinion on these uh, reforms? Are they fair in your opinion or not? We are globally for this reform. Um, but it didn't have, it doesn't happen at the right moment uh, because uh, uh, people, uh, uh, they suffer from COVID, they suffer from uh, the economic crisis and I think that uh, these reforms, uh, it's not the right moment. But globally, uh, with this reform, uh, I think that uh, in France, uh, the age of retirement is 62. Uh, in other countries in Europe, uh, the age is uh, between 65 and 67. And uh, we have a deficit uh, of the pension uh, uh, in France. And we're going to have a deficit during uh, the next years. Um, and uh, uh, the, the Council of the uh, Reforms uh, uh, of the Pensions uh, in France uh, um, uh, plans that there will be a deficit in the next years, then we have no choice. We can't have a debt and deficit all the time. In France, we have a huge deficit. We spend around 14% of the GDP for the pensions. Uh, uh, it's the highest uh, 
uh, figures in the OECD country. Renaud, if I can cross to you, uh, we've just been hearing there from uh, the other two guests about the, the differences in opinion, as it were, as to whether or not this change is fair. Now, the facts of the matter are, on the one side, you've got workers who have been working in very hard industrial jobs sometime, uh, sometimes, perhaps they want to leave there and retire a little bit uh, younger. On the other side, France spends 14% of GDP on pensions. The OECD average is much closer to 8%. If we look at how the British government spends money, it only spends 9% on the entire NHS compared to all NHS spending 14% of GDP on pensions, seems a little bit luxurious. Well, the, the, French, the size of the French government in general is bigger, so it makes some sense that public spending as a share of GDP in each sector of the government is going to be higher. No, to be clear, this increase in the, in the share of GDP that will be spent on pensions, say, in the next 25, 30 years, is indeed clearly something that will cost a lot of money, and it makes sense to think about whether you want to spend those extra, say, 20 billion a year on um, pension. So it makes sense to think about the reform. Uh, it makes sense also to wonder how fair this is. And you are talking about industrial workers. You would think about a typical example would be, say, somebody who started as a cleaning lady, like a very tough job, very early in her career. This person is actually the one who might suffer the most from the current plan of reform. And that's because they move the pension age as compared to previous reforms, so the one that is kicking in at the moment in France, which is changing the number of years that you work. In the current plan for the reform, people are penalized if they started to work very early. So it's not so much about the age at which you retire. So I was hearing Pierre saying um, people retire earlier in France. Well, very few people will retire at 62 when you have to work more years in total. The big difference is do you change the age, the, the, the age threshold from 62 to 64, or do you do like um, uh, the pension reform under François Hollande to um, increase the number of years that people have to work? So those are two different approaches. I think one of the main reasons why the current reform is seen as unfair is that moving that specific pension age is seen as something that, um, that is really uh, regressive in the sense that it will tax more people who have less money than people who have more. Well, let's have, uh, let's have a listen to some of the people who have a dog in this fight. Uh, here is a uh, comment from Elizabeth Bourne. She's the French Prime Minister, of course, and she says this. In 2030, when the legal retirement age will have been raised to 64, it will remain at 58 for those who started working very early before the age of 16. For those who started between 16 and 18, I'm thinking in particular apprentices, retirement will be possible from the age of 60. And for those who started between 18 and 20, it will be possible from the age of 62. Charlotte. That sounds inherently quite reasonable. Your concern here about some people who've been doing harder industrial jobs, some people who've been working longer uh, through their career span, does it not look like the government is at least attempting to allay some of your concerns? No, um, not at all. I think um, that this is very much a choice of how we want to finance um, this deficit. So we're talking about about 12 billion of, of deficit. But there's a, there's ways in which we can do that. Uh, Huna was mentioning about how much we're spending on our pensions. But we also have a third of the state budget that is going to support companies and the private sector. And that's three times more than in 1999. So we're, we could finance this in, in other ways. And this, um, actually, this new age, um, pushing it back to 64, is also going to create new costs, costs of um, supporting people through that age. And there's lots of issues around employment of people who are um, senior citizens. Um, we know that actually France has a very poor rate of employment for senior citizens. There's only 35% of people aged 60 to 64 that are in employment. And we also have one of the highest rates in Europe around accidents at work. So there's going to be additional costs in terms of our healthcare system, in terms of our benefit system. And more generally, I think this reform is really going against um, the climate priority that we have right now. If we go towards um, incremental growth, productivity, that's also going to have an impact on, on our environment. We know that a lot of researchers are showing that we actually need to go towards decreasing our time at work. So looking at a four-day week, for example, and also looking at being um, in employment for less long and long uh, during our lives. So there's different ways of doing this, and I think the government is not choosing the right method. We should also be able to ask citizens what would be their, their choice. Um, 
we know that, for example, if people spent, people on minimum wage spent 14 euros per month extra, then that would that would basically um, be another way of, um, of tackling this deficit. So, and that would enable them to gain two years of retirement age, time that they can spend to rest, to enjoy life, to um, basically have time for leisure, all of that time that they've deserved for working um, for a long time during their whole life. Yeah. Um, what do you make of those arguments? Well, um, you know, I was looking the figures in Sweden, for instance, 70, 76 people, 76 of the people between 55 and 64 work. I don't think that Sweden uh, is a, is is a, is a country without. Uh, social protections and uh, more people uh, work uh, in this country and I think that uh, it's not it's not a question of age uh, indeed if you work in the constructions you need you need to take uh, into account the fact that you can retire younger but if you work at the office if you work in administrative task if you work uh, um, in the railway systems, if you're a public servant, uh, if you are an executive, I think that working a little bit more uh, to have a pension, uh, a pension systems uh, uh, with a, a good, uh, with no deficit, I think that it's necessary. What is really uh, uh, necessary also is to increase the minimum wage of the pension. And that's the case. Uh, I am not totally for this government, but this government has decided to increase the, the minimum pensions up to 1,200 euros. That's a good, that's a good uh, uh, an advantage of this uh, pension, uh, uh, pension plan. Um, and then um, I think that... Uh, how, how do you afford all of this, though? I mean, it's got to be said, Pierre, France is already running a deficit. Economies, not just the French economy, most developed economies around the world are running into problems at the moment. Deficits are climbing. People can't reach for the easy, safe option that they did 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and go with quantitative easing. Governments simply can't afford to keep piling out with spending. There's a war on in Ukraine and we're sending billions there. Can we keep affording all of this extra spending? Uh, the money we spend to Ukraine, it's due to our democratic values and I think that it's uh, necessary and uh, nobody is going to criticize this. Uh, but uh, right now, we have to keep uh, um, a pension systems uh, without uh, deficits. And I think that it's necessary. What we have to do is to implement a plan for the seniors, is to increase the minimum wage, is to take into account uh, the, the long careers. Um, and at the end, uh, I think that we have to work uh, around 40, 43 hours to get a pension. That's what we do in the European Union, and we have no real choice. Uh, uh, we have to be in the average of the uh, European Union. Uh, we have sort of convergence between our economies, and we need to keep this convergence and not to have big differences between countries. That's right. why I think let that me, this... Let me cross it over to Charlotte, because Charlotte, uh, you, you seem very irate about some of those comments. Well, no, I think um, the, the interesting thing about the international comparison and the European comparison is that, you know, OK, France does have a favorable pension system. Should we not be proud of that? Should we not try and protect social justice? You know, if we look at other countries, so we've mentioned Sweden, for example, Sweden has a much more favorable parental leave. Are we saying, oh, you know, we should all even down and, and level things down in Europe and make sure that actually people have less rights? You know, if we look at, for example, support to younger people under 25 in the Netherlands or in Germany, 
people have access to benefits before the age of 25, which is something that is very difficult to access before, before, before that age in France. So is the idea to try and level down social justice in Europe, or should we try and protect the social system that we have and ensure that people have the right to measure to a good quality of life when they get older? Because actually we know that people who have done master's degrees, who have done studies, this, this reform will actually not affect them at all. They're already leaving at 65 and over, so this is not going to affect them. This is really targeted at people who are starting younger and who are doing some of the main, most painful jobs. We know that Emmanuel Macron in his previous term has already taken out certain criteria on painfulness, things like being exposed to toxic products, to severe noises, etc. So those are kind of things that we're not considering in our society that actually are damaging people's well-being, people's health. And then when they come to the age of retirement, they're not able to, to be in a good state. And so I think, you know, let's try and think of how we can make our system fair. There are other ways of targeting our deficit, like I mentioned, that can be through company contributions, through individual contributions. There's different ways of doing that. But pushing back the retirement age is not the only solution. Renault, this cool. is clearly, this is, a, this is a very contentious issue in France. So how do they square the circle? Well, I think like the, 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 the key word that Charlotte was mentioning to me is justice. Um, she's absolutely right to say that in, her first, in his first term, Emmanuel Macron uh, had a plan to do something which was much more ambitious, which was a point system that would really take into account different criteria. He failed to pass it. So maybe because he failed to make an agreement with the left, maybe because the left was against him. I don't have to blame anyone, but this failed. So this time he thought, OK, I want to cut that deficit. I want to cut the, the word deficit, by the way, is quite complicated in this context. Like, what you care about is how big it is in share of GDP, and do you want to spend 40% of your GDP on pensions? And the question of justice is there. Is if you do that, it means that the two extra percent of GDP that you spend on pensions, you don't spend that on better healthcare, you don't spend that on education, and so most importantly, at a time where capital is costly, because you don't have those zero interest rates at the moment, you don't spend that in the massive need we have to invest in the energy transition. So uh, as much as I hear uh, the concerns about fairness, I would, I would be very surprised if after the next presidential election, if the left is in power, they decide that their priority is to spend, say, 20 billion more a year on pension. I think they would hopefully try to find a fairer way to look at the system. But for the very fact, the very, uh, the very basic idea that if you don't spend the money on increasing pension spending, you can spend it on something, something else. And if you spend more on pension, it means that it's the young generation who is paying for the old generation. This question of intergenerational justice, the fact that there is at the moment a massive need to invest in the future, this is something that will not be easy to circle. And I would be surprised, really, if um, it was just a blanket return to the previous situation if the left come back or whenever the left come back in power uh, in France. So given, given that he's failed once already, uh, with slightly grander reforms, it must be said, so he has scaled them down a little bit, but given that he's failed once already and there's been a lot of pushback in the French public, we all know, regardless of whether he gets the reforms through or not, there will be protests against them. They will be severely disruptive. Those protests could even be as bad as the ones during the COVID period where we had uh, no petrol in petrol stations, as a for instance. But if we look at what he wants to do with these reforms, why does he think he can get away with it now, given that he doesn't have the power base in Parliament and he's already failed to pass the reforms once? Renault. Well, this time he has an agreement with the right. He's basically implementing the reform that the right-wing party in France was requesting, and there will be only opposition from the left. So this is a very different situation from the first term where even <coughs> within his own party, they were not quite sure what to do. And that's the problem with fairness, no? When you try to do something fair, you, you can spend ages trying to think about the best way to do it. Here, they do it something very easy, very simple. It's very similar to what Nicolas Sarkozy was doing when he was president. And the whole idea is to close your ears, try to go through, and uh, it will be done uh, we expect that in the summer. So I think this time it's quite likely to go through. The, the, whether it's fair or not is relatively irrelevant to this question. So yes, most likely disruption, but it's not at all a very long process. It will most likely give up something. So you can expect more about long careers. You can expect more about um, taking into account parental leaves, interrupted career for women, etc. In the end, it might actually be mostly an acceleration of the reforms voted under François Hollande. But well, I'm pretty, let's pretty have... convinced that it will pass 
process that we'll go through here. Let's have a look at some of these reforms, because the reforms are important, and there have been a lot of them over the last 35 years. So if we start off, we go all the way back to uh, President Mitterrand. So we're in the very early 1980s here. In 1982, the socialist president, Francois Mitterrand, reduced the retirement age in France from 65 down to 60. So the base that we're arguing about here isn't a base that was set in stone. It was reduced to this back in the early 1980s. Meanwhile, in 1995, three weeks of mass protests forced the conservative president, that was Jacques Chirac at that time, to abandon plans to increase the pension age for civil servants. So 1995, an attempt was made. It failed. 15 years later, we had conservative president Nicolas Sarkozy raise the retirement age to 62 from 60. 2014, Francois Hollande, you already mentioned him, socialist president, he defied protesters by raising the number of years workers need to qualify for a state pension to 43 years. And of course, three years ago, we had more protests. These were the COVID crisis protests, but they were also forcing President Macron to shelve his reform proposals then. So I've got to put it across to you, Charlotte. What makes him think he can get away with it now, given the history of this? It's, it's like a hand grenade with the pin taken out. Well, totally. And, you know, 68% of French people actually oppose this reform. So he's facing strong opposition from the left, but also from the people. And that's really important to know. And actually, all of the unions are in agreement here um, to oppose this reform. And this hasn't happened in 12 years that all of the unions are opposing such a pension reform. And I think, um, you know, as you, as you mentioned, you know, some of the reforms that have been done before, we've seen Mitterrand doing an approach that was much more in favor of social justice. And actually, when you ask people what they remember most of Mitterrand's term, it's the pension at 60 that is one of the key things that they really have valued. Sarkozy pushed through. There were like a million people in the streets, 12 years of strikes. And, you know, he pushed through his reform, which was um, severely unpopular. Um, and, you know, it's, let's see what, uh, what President Macron does here. But he has the advantage of having the conservatives on his side there. So I think there's no more doubt about where this reform is is in terms of the political spectrum. And um, and clearly, I think, you know, it's it's going to be critical to see how far he goes with this, with this very unpopular reform. We've seen that he was confronted in the past with the gilets jaunes and the yellow vest when he tried to put in place an unfair um taxation on a, on a carbon tax that was really um, going to be the same for even the poor people without supporting through, you know, transportation or, or green mobilities and things like that, something that wasn't very well thought through at all um, for a lot of people in society. It was a big, it was a big blow. And he had to, he had to withdraw um, that proposal and had to backtrack. So we'll see if he has to backtrack, but I'm encouraging everyone to mobilize, you know, in France against this and to join the unions in these protests. Yeah, um, when everyone's saying that, uh, that Macron's going to be able to push this through, but it's going to require assistance from the political right, the political left and right in France move a good deal more left and right than they do in many other countries around the world. Um, if we were to take a look at Le Pen's uh, presidential platform from a few years ago, it was line for line very, very similar to Mélenchon's uh, campaign platform, Mélenchon being from the extreme far left of the political spectrum in France. So if we go far enough to the right in France, are they still supporting these pension reforms or are they more on the side of the workers? Does that remove some of Macron's room to maneuver here? Uh, the far right, they don't support uh, this reform. Uh, uh, they are they they want to uh, pension systems. They want that uh, people retire at around 60 years old. But I think that uh, they have no real credibility. Uh, uh, indeed, I think that uh, uh, they prefer being. Uh, um, agree, they prefer agree uh, with the workers than uh, having some courage and, uh, uh, and deciding to reform these uh, pension systems. Indeed, we know that nearly 60% of the people, they don't support uh, the reform. We know it, but, because, but most of the time when you have this kind of reform, you have a majority of people not supporting uh, this kind of uh, reform. But um, I, I, I insist 
uh, that uh, the right uh, negotiates uh, with Macron some good, uh, some good uh, advantage of having a minimum wage of. 1,200, and thanks to the right now, we uh, people will have a minimum wage of pensions uh, increase, you know. Uh, we have a time of crisis, inflation. Renaud, um, la last word to you, if I may. The fact of the matter is this remains an extremely unpopular move in political circles. It's an unpopular move within France. Macron is a politician. Is he going to stay the course on this? Macron is a politician who has been electorally incredibly successful, if you think about it. He's run two elections in his life. He won. He always has a majority, and he's going to leave very soon. So if he cares about anything, for instance, in terms of legacy, I think he wants to be seen as the reformer, and I think he's smart enough to navigate that. Now about the unpopularity of this, I think my, my concern, number one, is that very few people think in terms of trade-off. So I was hearing uh, Pierre talking about, uh, it's amazing, we're increasing pensions. Well, this is clearly a reform that has been voted in favor mostly of retired people or elderly people who are mostly the electorate of the right and the center at the moment. I think the fact that instead of asking the question, do you think it's a great idea to increase pension age, you should ask yourself the question, you have 2% of GDP to spend, what do you want to spend it? And if your answer is pension, fair enough. But you need to think about that money. If it goes to pension, it doesn't go somewhere else, simply. Charlotte, Renaud, Pierre, thank you very much for uh, your time today and agreeing to talk about this topic. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just head over to YouTube, type in Roundtable TRT World and you'll find us. But for now, from me here and all of the team, goodbye and thank you for watching.